We won't dock your pay this time then. Zero to, from zero is a lot. You might go negative and have to pay me. So <laughs> that's what we're working on here. Proverbs chapter 1. By the way, we'll be getting to street preaching here uh, a week from this Saturday. Not this Saturday, but a week. And then we'll three weeks straight. We'll be preaching. So, uh, and uh, don't wear your Halloween costumes, guys. Okay, we're just, but we are going to the zombie pub crawl. They don't need costumes for that. They all act like zombies anyway. Right, brother? They all, they act like they don't need costumes. I'm glad it's not in Minneapolis, though, because, man, that's a rough place. We'll go to the Halloween capital of the world, and we'll, we'll go to that zombie pub crawl there. But, uh, and then the week after, is that the first one? That's the first one, the 14th, and then there's the 21st and the 28th, is that correct? Or something like that, where there's, we have two parades. We'll be preaching at all of those events and tracting all those events. Brother Ryan, do we have tracks? I'm making you're making them now? We'll make more? Right now, like while you're talking? Or? Oh, okay. All right. I'm a literalist, so you know. You're just kidding. Okay, good. You're making them. Did you change the cover? Keep it the same, or? Okay. Is Tommy in there or no? Not really. Okay. <laughs> you have a birthday, don't you, Tommy? <laughs> anyway, all right. Proverbs chapter one. We're going to talk about when wisdom cries out or when wisdom preaches, and uh, I. This is obviously. Uh, we're going to read these verses in, in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 20 through, through the end of the chapter. But really, uh, for young people, but as well as all Christians, uh, we need wisdom. Do you know that God, one of God's attributes is wisdom? God is wise. He is all-knowing. He is all-wise. All of his attributes hinge from his holiness. They all flow from his righteousness and his holiness. Because he is holy, he is wise. Because he is holy, he is perfect. Because he is holy, he is all those other things. You have to understand, because that's, that's who God is. Because he is inherently righteous and there is no, no darkness in him, there is no flaw in him. Uh, so everything, all of his attributes, but one of God's attributes that he allows us to partake in as children of God, one of those that he communicates to us through his spirit and through his word. Two witnesses, through his spirit and through his word. And those two, one of those attributes is wisdom. There isn't a, a born-again Christian alive here today that cannot have the wisdom of God. We can all have it. God has it for us. He has given, he has offered it to us. He has given it to us and he is continuing to give it to us in his word today. In his word, this is how God, if you want to know how does God give me wisdom, it's through his word. The, this book, this book is how you and I get wisdom. It's the only way to get it. Wisdom, that pure wisdom from God is from this book. You won't get it any other way. Uh, life and experience give you some things, but experience is different than wisdom. Wisdom comes from God directly. Now, God does use our trials to build our faith and to teach us things. But wisdom comes from God. It comes directly from Him to His children. That's why we can have it. God, and each man has a measure of that and will grow and continue to grow in that as he obeys and listens. Well, if you want wisdom, we're going to talk about that. We, James talks about that that God giveth to every man, right? He giveth it to, his, to, to every man liberally and abradeth not. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But here, the Bible shows us in Proverbs chapter 1 how you and I can have the wisdom of God and that, we are, that God expects us to walk in wisdom. You know God doesn't expect you to walk like an idiot or a fool. He, said, he gives you his word and he says, I want you to walk in wisdom. And he gave you his words. And he said, here they are. These are the perfect words of God. If you follow this, if you, if you want wisdom, you get it from this book. That's where you get it. You don't get it anywhere else. The, and this is in contrast to the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom is, is mostly filthy garbage. It just, it, 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 it puffs up a man's knowledge. They confuse knowledge and wisdom and it puffs them up and it, and it really makes them a fool. 
the wisest men in the world are Bible-believing Christians that are stripped of all their, their, their earthly pride and power and wisdom, and they're given wisdom from God. They are the wisest men in the world. A wise man will follow the Lord. If you, if you look around and you see successful people in the world's eyes, they're not successful to God. They're absolute failures to God. Amen. Don't get your, and that's, recognizing that is true wisdom, by the way. Recognizing that what the world offers for wisdom is dung. That's what it is. Recognizing what God gives us and following that and obeying that is a, is a wise man, right? That's wisdom. It's from this book. I Listen, I, I can't preach the praises of this book enough to you for you to understand that you must follow it if you want to be successful in this life. You must follow the words of this book. You must believe that they are all that you need. You must believe that as a child of God. You'll grow in that, but you must believe that. The, the worldly wisdom and everything else that is offered is nothing compared to what God's word is. It's nothing. This super, you, you want to know how you see Christians, they dodge things that, this world, that people in this world completely fall for? You know why? Because of this book. Because they read what it says and they believe it. And they're like, oh, yeah. No, I don't believe that garbage. <laughs> they're, they're spitting. You save yourself a lot of traps by believing God's word. Because this world is set up to trap you. It wants to trap you. But God teaches you how to stay out of the snares and not get, not get uh, entangled with the affairs of this life. They want to pull you in. Man, I'm not even going there, but I, I am for a second. They want to pull you into the affairs of this life. Like, they really want, want you to think that they were going to shut the government down. Like, we're going to shut the government down. Oh, no. What's going to happen? You'll stop spending money, maybe? I don't know. Like, you'll stop stealing from us? No, that won't happen. Oh, so nothing will happen, right? Right, nothing will happen. We saved the day. We did. We saved the day. We, at, the, at the 11th hour, and it's like nobody thinks this is theater, really. Like, you all don't think this was theater last night when they sign in at like 11. The government was almost shut down. Good. Right. I've seen this movie before. It's lame. Right. This is like part 35 or 300 of the same scenario over and over again. Well, it almost happened, but we saved it. What'd you save? You're gonna spend a trillion dollars. Like, what did you, I mean, like, shut it down. Shut it down. Good, do it, please. Anyway, that wasn't what I was gonna preach about, but we'll move on. But that's how you don't become a fool. Like, you don't really believe that. Like, it's gonna be bad if they shut it down. Why, what's gonna happen? Do you think they're gonna stop charging taxes? You think that's gonna happen? Yeah, because if they shut it down, then they won't collect tax. Oh, you mean the IRS isn't going to take all the all the M16s and all the guns and all like like armored tanks and everything else that the IRS has? Like they're going to stop doing that? I'm I'm sorry, I, I'm not. I got to stop. Okay, I <laughs> I got to. But it's just that's it's like you look at that stuff and you think, okay, really? Like why? So why don't I believe? Why don't I believe anything they say? Well, because I believe this book, and all men are liars. So. And if they get paid, and if, they, and if they're stealing money from, from people in America, well, they're definitely liars. And they have big offices up there, well, they're definitely liars. Because they get paid to lie. That's what they get paid to do. So there you go. Destroy the bubble. It's over. All right, let's get to real wisdom. All right, verse number 20. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long? Ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Good questions. God asks questions. The reason why he does is because you can never argue with the answers that you give to the questions he asks you. Because that's, that's, I mean, he asked you and you told him. That's what you said. Why do you think he always stopped the Pharisees? They'd ask him a question. He's like, well, I'll ask you a question. And they do, and they're like, well, I can't answer that. Yep. He's like, well, neither do I answer yours. Right. 
he stopped them dead and they didn't know what to, why because they would incriminate themselves how long you simple ones we love simplicity in the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge turn you at my reproof behold i will pour out my spirit unto you i will make known my words unto you that's a lowercase s that's god working with them right that's god working with them and teaching them what wisdom that's what that is that's god working in the mind of man his children he said i will pour out my spirit i'll work with you i'll give you my wisdom amen that's why it's there like that it means something doesn't it turn you at my reproof behold i will pour out my spirit unto you i will make known my words unto you amen that's god says i will you want to learn the book god says i'll make known my words unto you what do you have to do to do that ask him <laughs> ask him ask him to reveal it to you ask him to explain it to you ask him because i have called and you refused i have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but you have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. That's the prosperity of the world. It's the prosperity of fools. You want to know what the world, if you want to be successful in this world or do you want, which do you want more? Do you want to walk with God or do you want to be successful in this world? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Well, I want to make a name for myself. Well, you'll make one, all right. It won't be a good one, though, in God's eyes. If you seek after the prosperity of fools, you'll become a fool. You are a fool. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Amen. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear from fear of evil. Father, please bless us now as we look through this, these verses. Thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, wisdom cries out in a loud voice. This is an attribute of God, this wisdom. It is, a, it, it is, it is God's word crying out to us. There's a picture of this. Wisdom cries out in the streets where men travel. In the chief place of concourse where men are, right? In the gates where men govern. In the open gates. It refers to a place of ruling or judgment. What does Amos 5.10 tell us? They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. Why do they get so angry when you go preach on the streets? Because you're rebuking in the gate. You're going to the gates of the city where all the people are, and you're rebuking them. You're rebuking. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. They abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Is it like, don't kill your babies, and they got knives, and they want to, like, stab us. It's like, wait a minute. Why are you so angry? Well, you're speaking uprightly. The Bible says they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. You think they're going to love you. Oh, no, they're not. They're going to hate your guts. You say, but how could somebody hate something as simple as just don't kill babies? Like, stop murdering, stop killing babies. Like, you'd think they'd be like, amen. They'd be clapping for you. Like, you know, they, they'd be, and what do they do? They want to kill you. Why? Because they abhor what you're saying. They abhor. By, by the way, d did you know it doesn't even say that they abhor the, the words? It says they, they abhor what he's speaking, yeah, uprightly because he is, but they hate the person too. So you're not wrong to think that they hate you and the, and the words that you're speaking, because they do. But they hate you because of, you're telling them the truth. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. That's, that's not going to change on this side, right? That's, they're always going to hate. They hated Jesus. They hated John the Baptist. They hated all... They hated Peter. They hated all the prophets. They stoned and killed them, right? They hated Paul, 
who's the apostle to the Gentiles, who's our example, right? And, and the Bible says, whose faith follow, right? That's what Paul said, whose faith follow. So they, they hated him too. They're going to hate you. The, the gates are where business are done. Business is done. If there is anywhere that, that we need wisdom today, it's in the gates of the city, right? We need it in the, in, in the concourse, the chief places. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 16, please. We'll look at a few of these verses, but then we'll really get to understanding some things about wisdom and how it works. But De Deuteronomy 16, 18, this is in the gates. Judges and officers, shalt thou make thee in all thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with, the just, with just judgment. So in other words, there's supposed to be justice in the gates, right? There's supposed to be judgment in the gates, proper judgment in the gates of the city. What is there today? There's not. That's why when you go preach in the gates of the city, you're preaching wisdom to them. And what do they do? They hate it. Right? Because they're not just. That's why they hate it. Because they're not just. And you're preaching wisdom to them and you're rebuking them. That's, that's biblical evangelism. That's what it is. It is done in the gates. I like what one person said. God didn't call all men to come to the church. He called the church to go out to all men. That's right. Amen. That's the truth, right? He called us to go out to all the men of the world and preach the gospel to man, woman, and children. Right? You go out there. He didn't call them to come in here. He called us to go out there. And when they get saved, then they come in here. Amen? That's, that's God's way. Don't ever lose sight of that. If you do, you'll get jaded real quickly. People, people ask, I had somebody ask me the other day, well, do you find any profit in preaching on the streets like that? Do you find any profit in that? I was like, I was like, well, do you, like, are, are, do you get anywhere with it? I said, oh, yeah, we get a lot. Of, we go a lot of places with it. We get everywhere God intends it to go. Amen. Because I understand what the results are according to the scriptures. Amen. If I ever lose sight of what this book says, I'll quit doing it. Right. I'll be like them yeah. and not do anything. Indeed. Right? Yeah. But if I see with God's eyes what God says and from heaven's standpoint... That's wisdom. Do you understand that? It's wisdom because you're taking this book and you're giving them wisdom. And fools do not like wisdom given to them. They don't. They like to remain foolish because it's easier that way. They don't have to get right when they're given wisdom. And that's what you do when you go into the, the gates of the city. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse number 19. You better be glad these are New Testament times. Right? Some of you children in here, you'd be glad. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. Mm. Thank God for grace. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. So if you ate all your dad's hot dogs, you ate all your dad's steak. You ate the last cheeseburger, Garrick. He's going to bring you before the gates of the city. Right? They're going to stone you. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of wisdom. But anyway, that was for grievous errors, right? But that's where, where was it done in the gates? Why? So all men seen it. Same reason why evangelism is done in the gates. So all men see it. Evangelism is not done in this church uh, as a prime directive of what we're supposed to be doing. Is Christ, is, is Christ preached? Yes. Is the gospel preached every message? Yes. But is that the main focus? No, it's the edification of the saints for the work of the ministry. The gospel is a part of that, yes. But it's done out in, wisdom has it out on the streets in front of everybody. Why? Because they need it so badly, that's why. They need it. Do you understand, like, I believe that men need this book preached to them out there. Like, I believe that. I, I, I have a strong conviction that men need this book 
preach to, and this one, Amen. not Hebrew, not Greek, not a TR, this one preached to them. This one is my authority. This is, somebody asked me the question about Yodei Vodhe and all that other stuff, whatever that is, and, and, and Yahweh and all these other names. And Well, what do you think? I said, well, my final authority is this book. So if you're asking me what I think, just look in the book. I'll show you. Right. But this is, this is what I believe about that because this is my final authority. So I, I, I believe what God said about it. I, I don't, what about Hebrew? What about this? It, no, I, this book. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, before I'm done with you by the grace of Almighty God, I want you, you young people to grow up believing 100% by God's grace that this is your final authority for everything in this life. Until you go home, the instructions do not change. Amen. The words of God are there. And they are final. And they are your authority. And great wisdom will come to you if you believe that. God will give you wisdom. But if you despise his word, you'll be a fool. You know, there's a lot of Christian fools out there. I'll save that for a little bit. But there are. Jesus said, he looked right at him and says, Oh, fools, slow of heart to believe all so God gives you a book and you're foolish and slow of heart to believe it. You let some shifty men talk you out of it. Somebody in a seminary, a cemetery, somebody at a university is going to talk you out of God's holy word because they're smarter. Yeah, but, by the way, they're talking you into their intellect. You get that, right? They're, they're, they're giving you worldly wisdom for you to trust them over God's word. I'm not asking you to trust me. This is what I explained to somebody that was trapped in a cult and has been saved and come out of that. I said, look, I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm not, I looked at her and I said that I'm not asking you to believe every word that I say. I'm asking you to believe every word that God says. Amen. That's what I'm, I'm not your authority. This is. I'm not running a cult. I wouldn't be very good at it anyway. This book is where we stake everything. This book is, God, is the authority of God. This book. I'm not, trying to conv I'm not trying to win you over to my position. I'm trying to win you over to the word of God. Amen. Not my position. I want you to define everything you believe by this book. And that's wisdom. Amen. That's true wisdom. I said, you, you're... You've been taught wrong. See, they, you've been taught to, to believe the words of men. I've heard that, well, this brother says this and this brother says that. Now, I, I don't care what this brother says. I, I, I looked at that lady and I said, look, I don't give a rat's behind what they said. I don't give a rat's behind what I say. I care the authority of this book. Amen. And that's why you will respect the office and you will respect it because why because i i cast myself on the book like i just that's it that that's it i i don't i i'm not asking you to like believe every word that comes out of my mouth no believe every word that comes from there and see that's why i'm i'm not scared to lead like that that's right because it's god that I, i'm just doing his will and i want you to follow his word that's true wisdom See, somebody that's been taught wrong, well, here's what happens. They took a cult or somebody, they take the, the Bible and they piecemeal it in order, to, in, in order to confuse people. And I look at them and say, well, what they said contradicts clear scripture. That's right. So then what do you do with it? Throw it away. Amen. Throw it out. That's what you do with it. You throw it away. You don't accept it. Why? Because this defines everything. Everything. Has to. You want wisdom? There it is. It's all there for you. I'm definitely not getting through all this today, but that's okay. I, I kind of didn't plan on it anyway. So. But that's wisdom. The Bible says that Jesus Christ enlightens every man that, that comes into the world. Look at John chapter 1, verse 9.
Amen. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What's that? Yeah, amen, that's right. That's just plain Bible. You know, people can be wrong about some things and right about other things. That's why I don't fit in perfectly into systems of theology. I try to fit into the Word of God. <laughs> that's what I try to do. I don't try to, because without, with fear or favor, I care not. If it's right, it's right. I don't care who said it. If it's right, it's right. That, that's, what, that's the way we should be. God speaks to us wisdom through the light of creation, Romans chapter 1. Verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. God's power, even his eternal power and Godhead, are seen in creation. Amen. How about through the light of conscience? Romans chapter 2, verse 12 through 15. My son was just talking about this. We were, we were talking about this, these verses this morning. He's reading through Romans. And For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. It's the light of conscience. God gives a measure of wisdom to all men in the light of their conscience because he created them. He made them. There is a light that is in them. It is not the Holy Ghost, but it is, a, it is an amount of wisdom that is given to them to look up. That's right. yep. There's a law written on their conscience. It's like, you know, even, even crazy, rabid tribes in different places know that there are certain things. Well, you just don't do that. Why? Did a preacher come along with the Bible and tell them that? No. It's written in their conscience. They, they know that's not right. And they know, that's why men do things in secret. Because they know it's sin. You, you know, like they don't do it openly. Why? Well, they get caught and they know it's wrong. And they're ashamed of it. So they do some things in the dark because they're ashamed of it. Well, God shows you that that's written on their... How do they know that? Did some preacher tell them that? No. It's in their conscience. That's why your children, when they sin, nobody taught them some things and they do things in secret. And then you find out and you're like, what did you do? Well, who taught him that? Nobody. Who taught him it was wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Match fights. <laughs> I knew it was wrong. I waited till my mom and dad left, and I had match fights with my brother. And lit the attic on fire, and... Yeah. Those are... I knew it was wrong lit my brother's tent on fire. That I didn't do on purpose. But you'd be surprised how fast an old recliner will burn up on a fire. Like, fast. Don't do it. Don't do it. And he speaks most powerfully through the light of the scriptures. Look at Romans chapter 3. See, natural light will not save you. God uses the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, right? He uses his word. God uses his word. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. That's the scriptures, right? It's the oracles of God. You have the oracles of God right here. These scriptures. You have the completed scriptures. Amen. You have all of them. Amen. You have all of them. That's right. And through the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
which is to be preached to every creature. That's where wisdom comes from. True wisdom comes from through the gospel. It's given to you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wisdom is not, does not meet in secret societies, right? Wisdom is out in the open. You have the, the Masonic order, right? You have all these, these different, you have the Masonic order, the Jesuit order, you have the Knights of Malta, you have, uh, uh, what's those guys with those funny little fuzzy things on their heads? Shriners and the little, little funny car, ah, 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 those little cars that go, is that them too? They have little clown cars. Paul, did your dad have a clown car like that? He did? Right. So he had one of them little clown cars, right? Well, these people all meet in private and they all share the secret gnosis. What is the secret? Well, it's the mystery of iniquity. What the, the, the secret of all of it, if you really want to know, I can tell you through the Masonic order, uh, through any of the, the orders out there, it's the mystery of iniquity. That's what they're doing. What's, what is the revealed knowledge of the Word of God? Mystery. The mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifest in the flesh. That's the mystery of godliness. That's what, but the mystery is solved. God, when He shows you a mystery, He gives you the answer to it. He doesn't leave it in secret. Right. What do they do? They leave it in secret. Why? Because they have a secret to tell. What is it? It's the mystery of iniquity. It's the... It's the Antichrist coming. That's what their secret is. Their secret is, is their secret is on the dollar bill, right? Their secret is the pyramid. They give you some worldly wisdom. What's at the top of that? What's, what's at the top of that pyramid? That all-seeing eye? Who is that? Horus. Who is that? It's the Antichrist. The idol right. The idol shepherd. That's right. That's who it is. It's the Antichrist. And he is the capstone. Right? That's the capstone. The NIV calls Jesus Christ the capstone. Yeah. Why? Because it's an Antichrist Bible. That's right. That's, that's why. Because he's not the capstone. He's the cornerstone. Amen. He's the chief cornerstone. Amen? Right. Right. Of whom all the building yeah. is fitly joined together and compacted, right? Amen. But they have a secret, and they want you to get their wisdom. So they have all these books, right? And they have all these things, and they're teaching you all this weird stuff, and they're, they do it in symbols. By the way, when God shows you a symbol in the Scripture, He gives you the interpretation of it. Right. He shows you. He doesn't leave it a secret. Well, right. right. He, doesn't leave it, he doesn't leave it for you to, to be confused about. He gives you the answer to it. He tells you what it is. When there's types and symbols, and then Paul clears it all up in Hebrews, which I believe uh, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews, right? And... and uh, Paul goes all the way back and he, and he connects every, all the Old Testament types and shadows and he connects them all to Christ. And he says, well, they're all pictures of Jesus. The whole thing is. All of it is. So he shows you everything so you're not confused. But the Masonic order, the secret, the secret doctrine, all of those things, that's not the wisdom that God gives. That's the wisdom of man. That's the wisdom of this world. God wants to give that wisdom to all men. He doesn't want men to be without that wisdom. So he, he gave us a book, and he, get, he sent preachers to preach the word so all men would hear, right? God doesn't want you to close off. God doesn't want the gospel given to just a certain group of people. He wants it given to all men. He said he uses the foolishness of preaching. That's wisdom, right? There's wisdom in that. Wisdom, wisdom will teach you. Uh, wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the opening of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words. Openly, right? Not secret, not a secret doctrine. If somebody came in and asked you, well, what do you guys believe on this? Well, we'll tell you everything we believe. We don't care. We didn't hide nothing. We, Paul, Paul's sitting out, <laughs> he said out there, that guy walks up and goes, Would you, could you tell me again what you said? Could you tell me again what you said about your kids? And Paul's like, I beat my kids. He said, oh, I beat my kids. He said, because the Bible says, if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Right? And he kept saying, that guy was like, tell me again. Tell me again. He goes, okay. And he said it like solely. Why? He, he's not hiding anything. Because if you understand what that word means, that's not wrong. That's, that's not sinful. It's biblical. 
Amen. Right. They, they think it's abuse. No, you know what's abuse? Cutting the genitals off your kids and taking them to a public school. Now that's abuse. Right? Or not, or not beating them with a rod. Right? So they act like, well, we got to hide that. We don't hide it. We're just to tell you the truth, what the Bible says, and stand on it. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, I need to hide discipline from everybody. Well, I think everybody needs to mind their own business if they need to do. Amen. Just shut up, nosy, and get out of my business. How about that? Hey, Amen. How about you go take a hike somewhere and don't come back? That'd be great. Mind your own business. I've seen what you raised, you bunch of heathens. Killing kids, putting them on dope, drugging them up, taking their minds, taking their genitals. Right? Indoctrinating them with Satanism and statism, which is the same thing, by the way. It's a beast system. Right? Because you hate them. Oh, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. The Bible says you hate them. That's what God's word says. See, that's wisdom. Well, that sounds crazy. You can't tell people they hate their kids. Yeah, I do it all the time. I think you hate your kids. You hate them. Man, I see them when I listen to them talk. You, you listen to them talk. If you, if you have, if, if you have uh, three or four or five kids or whatever, children, they, they look at you like, you know how to stop that, don't you? Yeah, but then I'd be a little antichrist like you. I'd be a little devil like you. Amen. Right. See, but we're not allowed to be bold like that, right? You're supposed to be squeamish and go hide in the closet somewhere while the, while the queers come out and they run out of the closet. And you're supposed to go into the closet while they're holding the door for you. That's where all the preachers are today. They don't want to say anything bold to them. Man, I'd get right in their face and say it right to them. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to go back out again and do it. I can't wait for the next event so I can get out there with them old nasty grannies and tell them what I really think about them. Tell them what God's word says about them. Why? Because it's the nicest thing I can do to warn those disgusting, perverted people. That's wisdom. Don't sound like it. It sounds crazy. Well, it is. It's foolishness to the world. God says we look like a bunch of fools of the world. But I'd rather look like a fool of the world than look like a little sissy. Look like a little effeminate man that won't stand up and say anything and stand up for it. Right? Because that's where we're at today. A bunch of preachers too professional to say anything to anybody. Isn't that great? Love it. They got great images. Everybody likes them. Everybody loves them. Right? They got their big million dollar buildings and everything else and they won't say anything. Why? They're not giving people wisdom. They're teaching them to hide what they believe. Go hide what you believe and be afraid of the world. Man, I ain't afraid of them. How could I be? If God be for us, who could be against us? What are we going to do, run? We ain't got no place to go. This whole world is antichrist. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to hide from that? If you, if you go hide, if you go, go try to get a place in the mountains and hide up there, and live there, they'll come for you there. Look what they did at the Waldensies. They said, oh, we'll make it easy for you. Thanks for being on the top of the mountain so we can throw your kids off and kill them. They wouldn't do that. Oh, really? They shot some dude right through his stomach, uh, some dude's wife right through her stomach and killed her baby? Oh, that's extreme stuff. Oh, you mean like David Koresh when he was in that, when he was in that compound? They said, well, he's, a, he's not a good man, so we'll kill them all. So they burned all them kids alive and they killed all them children and burned them all alive. And then blamed him for it. Now, I ain't saying he was a good man either. But the point is, who's worse? See what I mean? But see, th th there's a difference in wisdom, isn't there? Right. The world's wisdom says, no, do it this way and be afraid and hide what you believe and, and go to a church where they have like parking bunnies and they're doing all kinds of cool stuff. That's all I can think about is that stupid church with the parking bunnies and all the goofy stuff. And it's like, that's what they do. And that's because life is like a canvas. If some dude literally in his skinny jeans stood up in front of me and he was singing and he was doing that and he was talking like that, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know what, well, I do know, I wouldn't be there, but I, I don't know how anybody takes that. Anybody with any kind of spine takes that at all. Especially a man. Like, how can a man walk in there and listen to that Fruit Loop talk like that to him? Life is like a canvas. It's really great. 
You're like God's canvas. He's drawing a picture of you, a smiley face. <laughs> Life is good with rainbows and smiley faces. And po yeah, I'm mocking them. I do it good. I have a career doing it. It's, it's, it's professional. I, that's the only thing I do professional is make fun of them. It's about all I can do. I can't do anything else professional, but that I can do really professional. And I have zero respect for false prophets that lead people to hell. I have no respect for them. God doesn't either. I mean, you do realize, like, when he comes back, he's going to stomp them with his feet like the horse's pride. He's going to, like, crush their... He's going to, like, he's going to kill them. He's going to destroy them. God has a lot worse things to say than I do about, about those people leading people astray. I just, I don't have any respect. And, and their little effeminate gay stuff, I have no respect for at all. Like, I, because when you walk down the street now and you can't find a man anywhere, you're, like, looking around, you're like, dude, why are all these people... And the women are walking up with, like, spikes and, like, yo, got any plans with the missus? I'm like, hmm. And, and that's more manly than the guys that are walking around like, I don't want to offend anybody. I do. I do. Because, like Spurgeon said, people don't get right till they get angry. They have to get mad first. Because <laughs> sometimes people just have to get mad before they can get right. It's true, right? Sometimes they do. I know I've had to. I've had to think about stuff, and a preacher preached the devil right out of me, and it's like, man, oh. I was mad at him, man. I want to kill him. I hated him, man. I was mad at him. I was like, you need to shut up. What are you going to do? And then, then afterwards, I got saved, amen? And I loved him. I appreciated it. I was thankful for it. Wisdom, wisdom's cry shows the great love and compassion of God. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, God, that's wisdom. That's what wisdom is crying in the chief place. It's crying out in the, in the, in the city, right? In the chief place, wherever people are gathered together. People need it. This world needs it. Wisdom's cry indicates her earnestness of this matter. She cries out. That's what the Bible says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Wisdom is a preacher that preaches and cries out to, to listen. The Bi you know what that means, right? Like a town, I try to explain that to people that think that Jesus whispered everywhere he went. Like 5,000 people, he's preaching. Jesus preached to 5,000 people, he's like, he was, he was whispering. You know, he wasn't, they, they really think that. Like, how do you, I always ask them that. Like, okay, so 5,000 people are gathered around him. What do you think? How do you think? You think he whispered to him or what? He preached. He lifted up his voice and he preached. He cried out unto them. And then John the Baptist, when he came, he was a voice crying. What does that mean? Was it just tears? Like when you think of crying, you think of like tears, like, like crying like that. Well, those are tears and that's weeping. Right. Yep. Crying is not the same as weeping. Cry aloud, yep. spare not. So all the so when you're up there preaching on the pulpit, when we're up there preaching out on the street and we're crying aloud, what are they trying to get us to do? Spare, spare them. Whatever they can do, they want to shut that preacher up from preaching loud. Why? They don't want him preaching loud. But what did God say? The total opposite. Cry aloud, spare not. It's the same thing. It's the same... Uh, idea and understanding when the Bible says not to spare the rod on the child, right? Not to, not, not to spare, not to hold back for his crying. It's the same thing. You're not to hold back for them weeping and wailing or complaining and crying over the preaching of God's word. Wisdom cries out. It's earnest. There's an urgency. Today, you have an urgency to be saved. If you're lost here today, you have an urgency to be saved. Why? Because hell is at your feet. That's why. Close. So close. If you're lost, if you've never been born again, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, wisdom is urgent. It puts an urgency on things. Biblical preaching is to put an urgency on things. That's why we preach the way we do. We know the terror of the Lord. We persuade men because we know it. That's why we preach. Every time we go out, we, don't, we, we preach with urgency. In, in the assembly, I preach to you with urgency. Like it is very urgent that you and I obey God. Whether you're saved or lost, the lost need to come to Christ and be saved. The saved need to obey what God has said in the book. 
you need to obey what God says in His Word. And there's an urgency on it. There's a fervency and an urgency on it that you obey God now, that you don't wait until later. Men get in trouble, and I'm talking about saved men. When God reveals unto them to obey the, Him and be obedient to Him and to follow Him, and they do not do it, and they consistently live in their sin and persistently live in their sin, after God has revealed to them to do right, there's an urgency there, and a wise person will receive that instruction and will say, you know what, I better, I better do that. I better get right. Wisdom's cry indicates earnestness. It's not merely just speaking. It's crying out. Wisdom cries out. As, as we raise our children, we cry out to them. There's an urgency. We're not just like systematically teaching them through some stale worldly book. These are the words of life. We're giving, like, I literally, listen to me. I'm going to say this very clearly. I literally believe that you will destroy your life if you don't follow this book that I'm preaching to you right now. I believe you will destroy your future posterity if you do not follow this book now. I believe it that much now. I believe that you will tear down your family like the foolish woman tear, plucks it down with her own hands. That you will do that if you don't as a mother follow this book or as a wife follow this book or as a husband follow this book. I literally believe you will destroy your family. I believe it. In fact, I'll go a step further. I don't think you can be a successful Christian in this life without being in a local New Testament church serving God. I, I don't believe you can be. I don't believe you can. Why? I don't believe you. I'm not saying you're not saved. What I'm saying is, is I don't believe you can be perfected as God wants you to. Why? Because it's God's design. It isn't mine. I didn't make it up. I couldn't make it up. I'm not that organized. I couldn't make any of that up. But what God, I believe that God uses the edification of the saints for the work of the ministry to build you up in your most holy faith. God's church is his design, not ours. It's... we're. I'm not meeting here today because it's an option for me. Yeah, right. I'm not here with you today because it's just some option that, well, you know, I don't, you can take it or leave it. That's not how God said. That's right. Not for he said that he said that he, he purchased with his own blood. That's right. God's blood. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not a mere just option. Well, I don't have anything better to do on Sunday, so I just come to church. If you see that like that, you're in trouble. You better, you better ask God to make you sensitive to that because it's not the case. You won't be the Christian God wants you to be without, without the Lord's church. Why? Because we all need each other. I need you and you need me. That's the way God, in, God intended it to be. Hey, that rhymed, but I didn't really, didn't really mean it to. But I mean that. Like each and every one of you. Amen. We need each other because that's how God made it. Iron sharpens iron. So I'm sharpened by each one of you, and I hope that I've helped to sharpen you. But I, I'm, I, that's what sharpens me. That's what sharpens you. That's, that's how God made us when he gave us his spirit. And Satan will do everything he can to talk you out of it, <laughs> to discourage you to keep you from the Lord's church. Everything he can. Every, he'll use me, he'll use you, he'll use anybody in the room to discourage you from, from, from doing that. It happens all the time. But wisdom sees God's way is always right. Wisdom yearns for men to be saved. See, you and I know what's coming for this world. They're, they're all having, like, you got the, the global warming people. You have all these people, and they're all talking about what's going to happen to the world and what's going to happen with this and that government in China and all, these other, and all this other stuff. But honestly, you and I know what God says in his word. We already know. We already know that the most dire need of the hour is for men to be saved. There is no greater need that this world has than Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is no greater, there's nothing I can share with you. You say, oh, my friend has cancer. I know they need Jesus now. They need Jesus now more than they've ever needed Jesus. Right now. 
but they need to be healed. No, they need Jesus. I don't want them to die of cancer. I don't either, but I don't want them to die without Jesus. Because cancer can only eat up the body. Fear him who, who's able to cast body and soul into hell. Right? You better fear that. Don't fear cancer. Fear Jesus. Amen. Right? We want them to be healed too, but we want them to be saved. That's the need. Of the, there's there's no, nothing wrong with the order of that. It is always spiritual. the spiritual need. They must be born again. We can never forget that and have that urgency on the people that you know. Their greatest need is not, well, they have cancer. I'm sorry, I don't want them to have that. I want God to heal them of that, but I want them to be saved even more than I want God to heal them of that. Because if they draw their last breath in this life, they're going to go to hell. See, that's biblical wisdom. That's, wis that's how wisdom cries out. We're not just, we, we don't, we, we don't just calmly explain that to people. We are crying out. Why? Because we understand what's coming. We understand the judgment of God. It's a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful. Wisdom cries out. Wisdom calls upon men to turn from their folly. Look at verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, we love simplicities, and scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. What is this? That's repentance. Wisdom calls men to repentance. It's a change of direction in life. It's a change of mind that results in a change of life. It's a surrender to God. The same God who offers salvation today to whosoever will may come. He will punish those who reject it. The Lamb of God has great mercy, but he also has great wrath. God calls men to repent. You know what the difference is in the lost and the saved? The false and the true convert? Repentance. Saved people repent. Obviously, the Holy Ghost is in them and they're saved, but saved people repent. When they're wrong, they get things right. People are like, well, did you repent of everything, everything, everything I knew of at the time that God showed me? And guess what? You're going to continue to do that as, lo as long as you're saved. You're going to repent of everything. God's going to reveal things to you that you're, you and I are wrong about. Amen. And you're going to have to get right with God. Did you think your getting right with God was over the day you got saved? I'll tell you why you think that sometimes. Because you have a very shallow understanding of God's holiness. And the longer you're saved, the more you feel like such a wretch. People ask, I like it. You ask a lost person, are you a good person? They'll say, yeah, I think I am. You ask a saved person, are you a good person? Nope. Nah. They ask you, do you think you're a good person? Nope. No, I don't. <laughs> people say, well, those people said Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, those people said it. Barnabas didn't say it about himself. He said, man, I'm such a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. You losers. <laughs> With a selfie and a meme on Facebook, right? He didn't say that, did he? Somebody else said, well, he's a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. God's Word said it. But he didn't state it about himself. If you asked him if he thought he was a good man, he'd be like, no. Pa ask Paul. What did Paul say? That is in my flesh dwell. No good thing. Rotten. Paul knew what he was. He knew that the only thing good about him is the Spirit of Almighty God that lived in him. Amen. And that's the only thing good about you, too. And don't you ever forget it. Your flesh ain't been reformed. Your flesh ain't been transformed. Your flesh is rotten as hell still. So is mine. Rotten, nasty, disgusting. What keeps you from being given over to it? The Holy Ghost of God. I, I still, I believe, the longer I'm saved, the more I believe that. The more of a miracle salvation is to me. Because I look at it and I'm like, wow. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't consumed because of God's grace. I'm not consumed daily from my sin because of God's grace, His Spirit. I don't, oh, no, you, you, your flesh is never going to be good. You get that, right? Like, it's never going to be good. You want some wisdom? Listen to that. There's never, you're never going to, your, your flesh is never going to behave. That's why it has to be crucified and cast down. Because it never does. It never wants to do right. Like, it, there's never a time where your flesh actually wants to do good. No, you, that's why the Bible commands you to walk in the Spirit. I can't believe how bad I am. Really? 
I can't believe you ever thought you're good anyway. Right? We're not good. God's good. There is none good but God. Right? That's what the scriptures say. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He's talking about repentance. This is wisdom. God, wisdom calls upon men to turn from their folly, right? Calls upon men to repent. We see that repentance in 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, chapter 7. I think I said 1 Corinthians. Paul says in verse number 9, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. You do realize he's talking to saved people, right? He's talking to you and I. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But it's a continual thing. But the sorrow of this world worketh death. You know why men go out and kill themselves? Religious men go out and kill themselves? They have no hope. They, Judas, no hope. He sorrowed, what did he do? He sorrowed unto death. He had no hope. See, that's why you believe that Christians don't commit suicide. Yeah, I mean, everywhere in the scriptures I've seen, it's always a lost person that does, it's never saved. Because saved people still have hope. Nobody went through worse things besides Christ. Nobody went through worse things than Job. And he watched 10 of his kids die, firebombed, all his land stolen, all his, all his stuff stolen. Wife was so desperate, she just said, why don't you just curse God and die? People said, she was a bad woman, though. She was a wreck. You'd be a wreck, too, if that happened to you. If you watched all 10 of your children die, your husband broke out in boils, everybody hates him, all your animals stole, everything you got's gone. And you're just sitting, your husband's sitting in dust and ashes. With his, and, it, and his three independent fundamental Baptist friends <laughs> tell him how much sin he's in. Oh, Job, you better repent. We know you're in sin. God's going to get you, Job. What'd you, do, Job. What'd you do this time, Job? We know you did something. Job's like, I'll die, but I'll, I'll retain my integrity. <laughs> now I rejoice not that you're made sorry. For you're made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, the sorrow of the world is not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow causes you to look to Christ and to look to God and say, Lord, forgive me. What a dummy I've been. Amen. What a fool I've been. It's sorrow, yeah. It's real sorrow, and it, it's ter it feels terrible, right? But the sorrow of the world work at death. But look what real repentance does. Wisdom that calls on men to repent. And by the way, that's saved men. You'll be, if you would be a wise man in this world, in this life as a Christian, you will, you will be repenting. You'll be sensitive to God's Spirit, and you'll repent when you're wrong, and you'll get it right with God. Amen. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. This is what, by the way, if you want to know what biblical repentance looks like from a saved person. That, that, now, we have evangelical repentance. Obviously, when we get saved, God shows us we're a sinner. We're guilty before God. We need to be saved. We're going to go to hell. Lord, please save me. I perish. Amen? It's as simple as that. But after you're saved, guess what? God continues to show you. You continue to repent as a child of God. This is what the child of God looks like in his life. For behold, this selfsame thing. This is what godly sorrow looks like in the, in, and repentance in the child of God's life. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. So there's a godly sort of sorrow and there's a worldly sort. The worldly sort is not wisdom. It's foolish. It causes men to hang themselves. That's, that's worldly sorrow. That's not godly sorrow. This is godly sorrow. After a godly sort, what does it do? What carefulness it wrought in you. Godly sorrow and repentance, it makes you careful. Oh, I'm never getting close to that again. Whew. You're watchful. That carefulness is the same thing as watchfulness, right? I'm watching. I'm careful. If you be careful, like, okay, 
Like yesterday, Brother Paul's up in that thing and he's cutting down a tree, right? So he's cutting down that, he's trying to be careful, right? He's trying to be careful. He don't want to fall. <laughs> he don't want to drop a limb on Garrick's head. Garrick's got a hard head, but you still don't want to do it, right? Right, Garrick? He, don't, he, he wants to be careful, right? What carefulness, what does that mean? He's watchful. He's like, wait, look where this is going. He's paying attention, right? Trying to pay attention. Garrick's on the ground like, oh no, hope dad's paying attention. What carefulness it wrought in my dad, <laughs> right? He's, but seriously though, that's, that, you're being careful, right? He's like, John, pay attention, right? Because he's careful. You want to be careful, right? What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Man, I want to be as clear from that as I possibly can. I want to leave no doubt in anyone's mind that I want nothing to do with that. To myself and to my Lord and to others around me, a, a clearness of myself, right? No, no, no a clearness of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. There's this holy indignation against your own sin, not your neighbor's, not your friend's sin, but your own sin. That's wisdom. Saying, you know what? I'm not going to make light of my own sin while I make a big deal out of everybody else's. You better be careful about that. Right? That, that, that while you're so busy looking at everybody else's sin that, you're, that you don't have an indignation for your own. Because this indignation is a godly sorrow. It's like, you know what? Yeah, there's some wicked people in this world. Yeah, I know, but how about me? How am I doing? Am I being careful? Do I have an indignation? Do I hate my sin as much as I hate my neighbors? Do I hate my sin as much as I hate Andrews? Do I hate my sin as much as I hate Brother Scott's? Brother Paul's? Do I hate my sin that much? Or am I kind of a bigot when it comes to that? Like, I, I hate his more than I do mine. Amen. But godly sorrow causes that, us to hate our own. Have that indignation towards it, right? Yea, what fear? That's a godly reverence. And be like, you know what? And a fear that I don't want to go back. I don't want to. I fear the Lord. When people are saved, the wisdom of God is to fear God, right? That's true wisdom is to fear God and give Him glory. That's wisdom. That's being wise. So I'm going to be fearful. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to get, not fearful like scared in that sense but respect and reverence. Like, I'm not crossing that line. I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere near that. What vehement desire. That's a, a passionate, strong, powerful desire not to fall into that again, against that sin that got me before. It's a desire against it, vehement desire. What zeal. It works a zeal against my own sin and for what's right a passion and a zeal for what's right. Like, I'm not falling for that again. By the grace of God. What revenge? You have a revenge against that sin. Amen? Right? We talked about, uh, you talked about that, about alcohol, right? So, so if you had a problem with liquor. Man, you get saved, you hate liquor. You're like, I'm, I'm going to preach against that, man. Abortion, anything like that. You, you have a revenge against it. You're like, man, you see some men and they have this like ardent zeal against sin. And you can't quite understand why they're so like vehement. Why are they so like driven against that? Because they have a revenge against it. They hate it. And they want to war against it in their own life and in, in sin in general. It is a war against it. Never to fall for that, never to get close to that, but to preach against it, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So you have a, you have a holy zeal against it. You have a reverence for what's right, a revenge against it. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That's really wisdom. That's being wise. Don't flirt with sin. That's a fool. Be wise. Stay away from it. Stay far away from it. War against it in your mind, in your heart. 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought of the captivity into the obedience of Jesus Christ. So it's, I, I have to war again. Like, I have to have a war and my own sin first. Right? That's, that's what godly sorrow does. When you have godly sorrow, you know it's godly sorrow when it leads you into the repentance, this type of repentance, as a child of God. It, it works that in you. That's being wise. Listening. When, when, you've, when, you've listened, when you've heard the truth, that you listen to it, you follow it. And you have a revenge against being wrong. Right? The difference is, is that I don't stay mad at somebody who corrected me and have a vendetta against somebody that corrected me. I have a vendetta against my own sin. Amen. Like, I'm not mad because that preacher, you might be mad at first, right? Because that's, I mean, human nature. We get in the flesh and we feel that way, right? Because it's a war. It's a battle. But once God's spirit shows us, man, I was wrong. I'm no longer going to, I'm not going to be mad at that person. I'm going to be mad at my own sin that I fell. And you ask God to forgive you, and you say, you know what? This is how I'm going to deal with this in my life. But well, your life's not over because you failed. You understand that, right? We've all failed. There are things that we've lost our temper before. We've spoken words that we never should have spoken before. Right? We've maybe looked at things that we should have. We maybe took a drink. We maybe done smoked some pot. I don't, maybe got into, uh, flirted with sin fornication or whatever. Your life's not over because you did that. What you do is you take all of that passion and that shame and everything, you take it to Christ. You, you have that godly sorrow that worketh repentance not to be repented of. And you say, God, help me to war against this. Help me never to fall for it again and to put every hedge of protection up that you've possibly given me to acknowledge them and not tear down any of those and keep them up and protect me. Amen. That's, that's godly sorrow that worketh repentance, and that's true wisdom. Right? You're not, you're not going to be perfect in this life. It's not an excuse to sin. But when you have, true biblical wisdom will teach you and show you that God forgives sin. And he'll forgive you, no matter what you've done. Amen. Why? Because Christ's blood is greater than any sin. He pleased the Father in all things. True wisdom will recognize that God's people need to walk in wisdom. That means if I sorrow over my sin after a worldly sorrow, if I catch myself doing that. By the way, if you ever deal with any uh, anxiety or mental health issues like anxiety or any of those things, um, depression, anxiety, different things like that, you will, you will revert to worldly sorrow in your mind. You'll revert to it. You'll go back and you'll, 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 st you'll, you'll start going down the trail of worldly sorrow. What do I have to do about that? Stop it. <laughs> Amen? Stop it. Stop doing that. No. What do I do? I walk in the Spirit. Well, but that means, you know, walking in the Spirit means that I, I did things the right way. Oh, no, it doesn't. It means you fell off that horse and you got to get back up on it again, even though I hate horses. But you, you have to get back up on that horse. So what do I do then? I practice godly sorrow. I, I have to... I have to actively do that. That's part of walking in the Spirit. So I'm not allowed to, as a, as a child of God, I'm not allowed to continue in worldly sorrow that leads me to hurt myself or harm myself or, or to wallow in pity. No, 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 you're not allowed to do that. See, you're, what are you doing? You're going on, you're, you're going on autopilot. Your brain is on autopilot and it's set for that because of things that you've done in your life or, you know, whatever. It, it could be anything. Fall in nature. Put it up to that, okay? It's a broken mind. We all have broken minds. Some of, some of our minds are more broken than others, <laughs> right? But we all have broken minds. Like Spurgeon said, we're all off a little bit, right? 
And we are. Everybody has that. Okay. So your mind will go on autopilot to the Did you know that your that your mind and your heart automatically walks in the flesh? Like you don't even have, like you can get up in the morning and it automatically does it. You could be sleeping and it automatically. Does. Did you know that? Did you know that it automatically does that? Wait, what are you saying? I thought when I got saved, it was going to automatically do what I was supposed to do. Well, that would mean that you didn't have to work as a child of God. I'm not talking about working for your salvation. I'm talking about working out your salvation. I'm talking about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. So your mind is broke. So it automatically goes to worldly sorrow. It'll, it'll do that. I can't believe I did that. My life is ruined. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I got into sin. I can't believe I, I did that. And then you're, and it, you're, it rolls around in a circular reasoning. It's like a hell-filled circus. And you just roll around and you're like, I did that. I can't believe I did that. And what am I going to do? I mean, this is this and this. And you start going through all the, and, and by the way, the worst case scenario comes up for everything. Automatically, worst case scenario. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. Listen to me, please. I can help you. I know I can, because God's word is very clear about this. But you start going into circular reasoning and everything's bad, everything's ruined, everything's terrible, and negativity bias right away, everything is bad over one thing. And you just you go down that road. And pretty soon you're you know, you're like Adolf Hitler and you gassed four million Jews. Right? And that's all before you pull out of the driveway in your truck, right, Jacob? <laughs> that's all that's a What's that called? Monday morning, <laughs> right? It's just Monday morning. That's all it is, right? It's driving to work, right, Brother Paul? It's, it's driving. It's life. It's just living life. You say, but you don't tell anybody. I know you don't tell nobody that. But I'll tell you, I done it. I do it. I have to stop it. Really, you do? Yeah. Oh yeah. Terribly. I have to. I have to literally stop it by by walking in the spirit and saying, "That's what do I? How do I correct it with this book?" I correct it with this. Well, what does God say? Well, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That when the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Walk in the Spirit. All of those things that the Bible... And then God shows me, well, godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. So what do you have? Godly sorrow? Is it leading you to walk with God or is it leading you to, to wallow in despair? Say, so, well, it must mean I'm not saved. No, it must mean you're lazy and you're putting your mind on autopilot and you're just letting everything happen and you're not, take, you're not commandeering it. This is, listen, we are not to be passive in the sense against our own sins and our own mind. We are to be assertive and aggressive. How do we do that? The Bible doesn't say float in the spirit. It doesn't say just kind of, you know, wade in the spirit. Coast in the spirit. It doesn't say what does it say? Walk in the spirit. So you have to walk. You have to, you have to, you have to walk in the spirit. You have to force your mind to do right. And you take that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me. And you leave it there. And you walk with God. And you think this way. Well, how do I deal with that? Well, I have all this, I, I have all this negative energy it going towards that, right? It's all going the wrong way. It's all going towards worldly sorrow. So what do I have to do? By the grace of Almighty God, I've got to change it. That's what repentance is. I change, I, it's a change of mind that leads to a change of action, right? So what do I do? I change that. I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what you said to do. You said to take all that guilt and fear, take it to the Lord, and then what do I do with this matter? I, careful, uh, for behold, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. I turn it. And I do, I think the way God wants me to think. That's how it works. You think on these things, not those things. These things. Amen. And I believe God. Most of the time you have problems in your mind with, with extreme guilt like that as children of God and, and it's flowing around your mind. Most of the time it's because your thinker is wrong. You're thinking things that you really don't believe. 
How do I know that? Well, if a man came to you and asked you how you could be born again by the Spirit of God, you would say, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You'd say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But what do you do when, you have, when your mind is not working right? You have all these doubts and fears. All that, you, you ain't preaching that to yourself. You're preaching all the reasons why God's word must not be true and that you must not really be saved. It must not apply to you. But you'd never tell anybody that, would you? You wouldn't tell anybody that's how you're saved. You'd say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right? So that's how I know you don't really believe that. You're just entertaining that. So the only way to fix that is to take the word of God after a logical manner. You do it with the Bible. God's word does it. Well, that's just not, well, I have all these, yeah, but you have all these doubts, but what does God's word say? So what do I do? I, I fix that with the mind of Christ. And I wasn't planning on talking about any of that. But anyway, somebody needed it, and praise God, they got it. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, we do suffer from broken minds at times and, and broken hearts. And Lord, we're broken people in many ways. But you came to set the captives free. And Lord, we thank you for eternal life through Christ. We believe what you said. Lord, help thou our unbelief. Help us to have true biblical wisdom by following your word, by listening to the word of God as you speak to us, Lord, and we read it, and as your spirit drives home those truths. Help us to believe what you say, what you wrote in your word, what you gave us, Lord, and nothing else. Father, help us to be people of the book. Thank you, Lord, for eternal life through Christ. Thank you for this church. Thank you for each and every person. Thank you for bringing our baby boy into the world, Lord, safely. God, I don't take that for granted. Thank you. Thank you for answered prayer. Lord, bless our homes, bless our families, bless our time together.